Watching TV is what we all do to pass the time. To see something entertaining on our favorite shows or movies, see what's on the news, and watch our favorite games. But on very rare occasions, see some of the darkest mysteries shown on screen for us to witness. So, on this video, I'll be showing you the darkest TV mysteries. Don't worry, I won't talk about the more popular entries you heard of over and over again like the Max Headroom incident. These entries are not well known and they are pretty dark and mysterious. Let's begin and also I'm doing something special for the outro of this video. Because YouTube has randomly given me early access to a brand new award. And I'll show you guys what they sent me and it's pretty interesting. Alright, enough talking, let's do this. Lucky 7 was a pirate television station believed to be one of the first ever to operate in the United States that aired for three nights in the spring of 1978 in Syracuse, New York. Lucky 7 aired for a total of 25 hours during the evenings of April 14 to April 16 on a VHF Channel 7. Lucky 7 included episodes of popular TV series like Star Trek and The Twilight Zone, as well as several films unavailable for broadcast television at the time, Rocky and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. According to a New York Times report, a man with a gas mask and a noose around his neck was seen on screen occasionally making jokes, bragged about the station's capabilities, and claiming that half the TVs in Syracuse area were able to see the broadcast. So whoever is behind the Lucky 7 broadcast, they're they're pretty professional and some people believe that they were actually students of the Newhouse School of Communications. Lucky 7 made national news with the real Syracuse TV stations featuring bits of the pirate broadcast on their own news shows. But unfortunately, as of right now and maybe never, no footage, no screenshots, and no audio recordings have ever been uncovered. Nothing. Only witnesses who remember watching the pirate broadcast. For example, in 2009, a user on the RadioDiscussions.com forums made a topic asking for any additional information regarding Lucky 7. I saw the Lucky 7 broadcast. A user named Rob Jason replied, I was watching on a 1968 BMW Panasonic 12-inch portable with a one-pole VHF antenna. They also ran Rocky, not even a year old then, and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I saw it in Liverpool near Route 81, Galeville to be exact, maybe 4 hours as the crow flies from SU, Syracuse University. The signal was very poor, I could not get audio, and it was snowy. This is where the most prominent theory on the identity of the pirates lies. Many people have speculated that the pirates were students at Syracuse University, seeing as Lucky 7's signal was clearest near and at the university. Syracuse is home to the Newhouse School of Communications, so it is very possible that a group of communications students could be behind the pirate station seeing as they have the knowledge and the equipment to do so. Me personally, I do believe that whoever is behind Lucky 7 were probably a group of students. And I do hope that one day we might discover this piece of lost media of one of the earliest darkest TV mystery. Just imagine watching TV at night and seeing someone with a gas mask and a noose around their neck. How creepy would that be? Oh yeah, we're going back to this one. If you're confused, then you definitely have not watched my other video, YouTube's Unknown Dark and Mysterious Videos. Pretty much in the name. But guess what? If you haven't seen the pinned comment on that video, or haven't followed me on Instagram, IG, I announced that I will soon do a part 2 of YouTube's Unknown Dark and Mysterious Videos. Because I, I discovered more 
very fucked up videos that not a lot of people know about back to the century so i briefly talked about it in my previous video so if you haven't watched it let me explain in the year 2000 an episode of scariest places on earth was aired on october 23 2000 to october 29 2006. in the second episode the show talked about three scary locations the eastern state penitentiary the new jersey pine barrens and finally the paris catacombs the episode joined by a french filmmaker francis friedland who is supposed to be the owner of this found footage of what appears to be someone exploring the deepest parts of the catacombs. Keep in mind that it is unknown how big is the catacombs and only a small section of it people are allowed to visit. So whoever this person was knew what they were doing but at the end of the footage it seemed that they may have regretted going this deep. Here is a part of the episode where Francis showed the found footage. And these pictures of bones. Uh, the person begins to walk faster and faster. Then he begins to run. We hear his breathing get louder and louder, uh, as though something was scaring him. He was, he's, he's frightened, he's frightened. Occasionally he stops, perhaps, to try to decide which way to run among all the many different corridors. He's running faster and faster and faster, deeper and deeper into the catacombs. And all of a sudden, he drops the camera. He just dropped, the camera just drops on the ground and keeps rolling, and you see his feet just run away. And he keeps rolling until it runs out of tape. The footage supposed to occur way back in the early 1990s was discovered by a catacombs explorer who then gave it to Francis Friedland and shared it to the American TV show. The mystery is, is whatever happened to the person in the footage. What scared them? Who was it? Some and even little part of me thinks that this is a hoax created by Francis himself, but I still believe it's possibility of the footage being real. But let's say this found footage is real. What can we know? The catacombs and get this also served as a space for bars, movie screenings, art and concerts, and still does it to this day thanks to cataphile culture. There are a group of unorganized people who knew the catacombs well and go exploring through them at night. Some are willing to lead outsiders down, but many are aggressive towards anyone who acts often online to be guided or let in. So could this be that the person who left behind their camera could be a member of the group? Very likely. Did the found footage really took place in the deepest parts in the catacombs? Actually, yes. Francis and a camera crew from the show explored the deepest areas and discovered familiar spots like this part where we see in a wall the remains of a person with arms and legs stretched out. Now let's say this is fake, but since the episode aired in the year 2000, no one who has worked on a show has ever come forward to reveal it's fake. On April 5th, 2014, Francis Friedland himself makes an appearance on a special episode of Ghost Adventures called Netherworld. Zach Bagans interviewed Francis discussing about the catacombs and asked Francis if he would ever return to the catacombs. Speaking of ghost adventures, let's talk about this next entry. This one is something very paranormal and I don't tend to immediately believe in the paranormal when something unexplainable happened. So Ghost Adventures, another favorite show of mine, started way back in 2004 when they made a documentary on exploring two haunted locations in Nevada. One was the old Washoe Club in Virginia City and the other was a Goldfield Hotel in Goldfield. When they explored Goldfield Hotel, they did their usual investigation like using devices that the ghost can communicate through. They hear noises from upstairs or downstairs. They ask the ghost to do something. And in one moment, one moment changed everything. Here's the moment that freaked them and me out. Making all that noise. This is the room. What room? Is that you making all the noise? Christ. 
please help me. Hey, Nick! So yeah, probably the most craziest shit ever happened in Ghost Adventures. Now I know some of you are like screaming at your screen right now saying this is bullshit like this is fake. This is fucking fake. But this part got me convinced that this is not fake. We may have run, but we ran with this imprinted on our film reels. I'm going to take a look at some additional footage captured by Zach and Nick. Uh, I'm going to give an analysis to see if it's been tampered with. All right, I've got some editing software that is used for um, uh, infrared and uh, night vision cameras and surveillance cameras that uh, allows you to pick up things that you can't see normally with the naked eyes. So we're going to go ahead and get started with that right now. All right, we're going to take a look at some footage here of a brick that uh, takes flight. And here you can see it go off right here, right there. I'm going to bring up some graphics right here in a second that's going to show you of a straight line on which if the brick was launched or pulled in any way that it would have gone in a straight line. And you'll be able to see that underneath the line, you'll be able to see the brick come right here underneath the line there, kind of dip down underneath of it right there. Here's another view of it dip down and kind of went in an arch there. So, in my opinion, that it doesn't look like it's been uh, tampered with. It looks like that uh, some something uh, threw this brick. The next thing that I visually observed is the spinning of the brick. Okay, I'm using the vector scope here to uh, enhance the video. Uh, I'm getting rid of the ambient noise or the fuzz uh, to see if there's any fishing line or rope or string or something attached to the brick, and you would see it uh, with, in, in through the video here. You would be able to see the lines of, of it, as, especially after this brick takes flight, and clearly there's nothing here. Based on this guy's analysis of the footage, he concludes that this flying brick scene isn't fake. But what do you guys think? I did say that I won't be talking about the more popular entries, but this is actually a big update for the Joanna Lopez mystery. If you don't know or need a quick refresh on the mystery, let me explain. On the early Saturday morning of January 14, 1989, WMAQ Channel 5 in Chicago, Illinois was signing off after doing a few PSAs, meditation with Reverend Claude Tears, and finally the sign off, which is the national anthem, playing as the United States flag is being raised up. As the camera zooms in to the flag and the song has ended, it cuts to this. The silence background with static noise, the low quality overexposed photo, and little to no information on this person. People feel unsettled by this. This is Joanna Lopez, and she's been missing since 1989. The exact date when she was declared missing is unknown. So why are people suddenly on this case recently? Well, given the fact that little to no information has been displayed, and no voiceovers giving more details of Joanna like her age, height, or her last known whereabouts. Just a photo, her name, and a number once belonging to Chicago Police Department Youth Division, but is now no longer valid. With no newspaper articles or records of a missing youth named Joanna Lopez, it seems that Joanna Lopez doesn't seem to exist. Redditors have tried solving this case and may have found a possible answer when searching through the Doe Network, an online voluntary organization that explores cold cases around the world. Redditors found a Jane Doe whom they believe this could be Joanna. If you look at the date of discovery, the body was discovered on May 24th, 1994, five years later after the missing report of Joanna Lopez on the WMAQ Channel 5. The body estimated to be 18 to 22 years old, and the killer claimed that he didn't get her name, but said that she worked as a prostitute. The estimated death was within 24 hours prior to the police's discovery. So, if this 18 to 22 year old Jane Doe was Joanna Lopez, then this means that she was 13 to 17 years old 
when she was been reported missing, born between the years 1972 and 1976. But something interesting happened in 1991. This is WMAQ-TV, Channel 5, NBC Television in Chicago. We now leave the air and wish you a pleasant good morning. There she is again. This time the photo's resolution is slightly better. Two years after the first time Joanna Lopez missing report displayed on screen. Why did display the missing report of her again? Could it be that she was found sometime after her missing report in 1989 and later went missing again in 1991? It's likely. Let's finally get into the updates. Number 1 the second broadcast. Users theorized that the second broadcast of the missing report on Joanna Lopez in 1991 didn't actually happen. Instead, believing that this has been a mistake and the first broadcast in 1989 was the only time it was aired. Others believe that second broadcast did air, but the dates of the two broadcasts are actually closer, maybe a couple of days or a week, meaning this all happened in the same year in 1989. If that's true, then the timeline will be much easier to understand, as the 1991 report has caused confusion. Second update, and this is the biggest update of them all, a Joana Lopez was contacted. A Reddit moderator named Cringe Nene Baby 2 has made a post which states the following: User Bubblegum just contact me on the Discord. They just got off the phone with a Joana Lopez from Chicago who ran away from home in 1989. They said it could be her and that she will get in touch soon. Is it an unfortunate coincidence, or is this our girl? Only time will tell. But two Joanna Lopez's going missing in 1989 in the same city will be ridiculous. We will not be disclosing how we got the number out of the safety and protection of the people involved. But I have verified the information with Bubblegum. They're being honest. Now we just need to see if Joanna will come through and call us back. If she does, we may be at the end of investigation. If she isn't, we've got the world's worst coincidence on our hands. Stay tuned. We're giving her one week to call us back. Then we will text her and try to figure out what's going on. So if there aren't any immediate updates, we apologize. Edit. Okay, it's been about three months and obviously we can get a hold of her. We've got a pretty satisfying theory as to how this whole incident has gone down and I can pretty safely say Joanna is safe. Please do not harass her or anyone involved in this case. I get this is frustrating, and we will likely never 100% know what happened. This doesn't mean it's worth bothering anyone. I don't want this investigation to remember as being handled poorly. Let's do the right thing. Although this post was made on February 15, 2022. It's been, and as of writing this, almost six months and still no callback from this individual. Obviously, this is not yet 100% confirmed to be true, and it's very possible that these Redditors could be lying. But for now, like I said, that's where we're at. Waiting. Waiting for a callback or someone to come forward to say this is untrue, or for Joanna Lopez herself to be found. Only time will tell. Here's another paranormal entry on April 17, 2014. The strongest were hosting Defensor Sporting of Uruguay, aired on the Fox Sports channel. During the soccer match, around 91 minutes, we see this. 
Saca del arquero, le pega fuerte a la pelota. Es correcto, ninguna molestado. A lot of people has come up with a few explanations. People dismiss this as a reflection or double exposure of one of the players on the field. Some believe it was put there to scare viewers, but that's very highly unlikely. And some believe that this, in fact, is a ghost running full speed across the spectators without their notice. Do you believe in this? Last one here on the list, and if you thought about subscribing, now is the time to decide. Of course, subscribe to my channel if you like this video based on my script writing to my recording process. And by the way, bought a ring light. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. Hold on, let me turn on the brightness. Yeah, that way you guys can see me clearly. Oh, right, I could change the colors. Boom, boom, boom. But we're going back with this one. And I rem I'm not wearing glasses because the reflection of the computer screen is like kind of annoying. So I took them off. So if you enjoy how this video is looking uh, and you want to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications. Also, if you want to see what video is coming out next, be sure to follow me on Instagram. Finally, back to the video and I saved the best one for last because this entry jump scared me. Now for me, I don't get jump scared much because I can predict a jump scare before it happens. And even if the jump scare came out of nowhere, I wouldn't flinch. But on September 10, 2010, at around 4 p.m., the Wedding Central channel aired an episode of Bridezilla's. And during the episode, the screen started to glitch, and then the episode was being interrupted. It's not fitting. All right, y'all better be ready. <laughs> During the interruption, a shadowy figure with an unnerving face, kind of remind me of the troll face, appeared for about 10 seconds. The incident disturbed and dissatisfied many viewers and called the network as soon as it happened. As a result, the network assumed that the incident to be a merely broadcasting glitch, possibly coming from another station, and they were easily able to get their signal back as soon as the interruption began. The hackers involved in the hijacking were never found. In my opinion, this is much scarier than the Max Headroom incident and the Wyoming incident, which I just found out recently that the Wyoming incident was an ARG. I thought, I thought it was real. It is pretty bizarre that the hackers decide to target Wedding Central and make the audience see something really creepy. I'm surprised that this hijack isn't talked about much, alongside with the other entries I'll talk about on this list. They have been the darkest TV mysteries. Thank you guys for watching, and now to unboxing what YouTube has sent me. I'm such a dumbass. Okay, so right now, it is the 4th of July, and the package came today, and my dumbass started opening immediately without recording it. So this is where I'm at right now. So as I open this, there's a logo, and uh, here's this thing, and I believe whatever's behind, underneath this is the awards. So um, here we go. In three, two, one. What the fuck? What is this? All right, so enough bullshit. I made this. This is the my very own custom YouTube subscriber milestone award for only merely 20 subscribers. And why 20? Well, back in 2017, I s tried to do YouTube, but I failed miserably. I just, every day I was like, okay. I looked around my room, I was like, okay, what, what video should I make? What, what should I do? Uh, oh, hello, bird. I managed to gain 19 subscribers. So 19 people who I don't know have subscribed because they think my channel is pretty cool. And that really me means a lot to me. Same thing now. So yeah, I'd like to thank you guys so much. 
and originally I really wanted to write down all the names of the people the first 20 people who subscribed to my channel on this award but unfortunately I cannot see all 20 of you so I just might as well um, just write down the first 20 people I, who I know are subscribed like in the back here and I'll probably it's, it's pretty small so I have your name's got to be short uh, maybe like a side right here both sides that's what we're gonna do so if you subscribed doesn't matter if you subscribe before you hit 20 or after 20 just just tell me quick this is the biggest award this is where it all started and I don't know what else to say but uh, thank you so much I don't I think I said everything so uh, me and my brothers we're gonna go ahead uh, go to a spot where we're gonna blow up some fireworks to celebrate not this goddamn country but me surpassing 20 subscribers so let's go all right so here we are at the spot uh we're gonna go ahead and blow some fireworks um it's my uh my car i bought it for like 20 bucks yeah it's cool it's also everyone around here and i believe the entire country here is celebrating my 20 subscriber special so for everyone here who is blowing up fireworks as of right now, as we speak, thank you guys so much. It really means a lot. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and watch the fireworks. Thank you, everybody, for 20 subscribers. Oh my god. Oh shit. Um, I hope everyone's alright over there. Where's the fireworks? Why did everyone stop? Where's the fireworks? They stopped. What happened? Did I, uh, did somebody unsubscribe? Now I'm down to 19. Oh! <laughs> 